Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So um, yeah. So this talk is essentially what uh, a bit like what Richard is trying to do with uh, epilepsy, uh, but applied to schizophrenia and with slightly um, less complex and nice looking figures. Um, essentially, what I'm trying to do is not look at uh, macroscopic connectivity in the disorder, but um, infer pathology in, in cortical microcircuits um, from MEG data and EEG data and a little bit of fMRI data in, in, in schizophrenia. So um, can I advance this slide? Yes, so uh, acknowledgements um, mainly go to Elliot Hong for collecting um, all, this, all this data and then lots of uh, people who helped me to analyze it. Um, so some of you might be aware that there's been a hypothesis for 20, 30 years that, that um, one of the key neurobiological problems in, in schizophrenia may be uh, an imbalance or alteration in the function of excitatory cells, these pyramidal cells in cortical circuits or um, inhibitory cells. Um, it's known as the EI imbalance hypothesis um, by many. Um, but the exact nature of the uh, imbalance is actually quite poorly specified. Um, so, if it's, for example, it's not quite clear if the primary problem is, is with a loss of excitability of pyramidal cells. Um, probably would, this would be due to NMDA receptor uh, dysfunction on those cells, making them less um, responsive to their inputs. Um, here on this toy diagram, that's illustrated by an increase in this self-inhibition uh, parameter, but it means the same thing. It just means they're less excitable. Um, alternatively, there may be a loss of excitability of interneurons causing a disinhibition of, of pyramidal cells. Um, this is, uh, picture is kind of favored by the, the, the ketamine-based hypothesis of, of psychosis. Um, or there could just be a loss of connectivity between these two um, cell populations, you know, synaptic pruning. And um, one way to try to, to uh, infer what is going on in vivo is to use this dynamic causal modeling approach that Richard was talking about in his um, presentation. And um, as he mentioned, we essentially have this microcircuit model containing superficial pyramidal cells, deep pyramidal cells, interneurons, and spiny stellate cells that is embedded in a, in a larger cortical network in, in uh, many cases. So for here's, for example, is the, there's a microcircuit in, in inferior frontal gyrus, there'll be another one in superior temporal gyrus, and these two areas might be activated by our EEG paradigm. Um, and um, so what we're really interested in is particularly this, this self-inhibitory connection here, which corresponds to this, this self-inhibitory connection or excitability parameter or relating to uh, pyramidal cells. Also this one relating to inhibitory interneurons. Um, now the data that we're fitting these models to was collected over a number of years uh, in Maryland by Elliot Hong. And uh, he had a fairly large sample of about 100 controls and 100 uh, patients with a schizophrenia diagnosis who underwent a variety of paradigms. So one was a simple resting state EEG. Uh, one was a mismatch negativity, this auditory oddball paradigm where uh, subjects hear a sequence of short tones and then a deviant uh, long tone. Another paradigm is this um, known as the auditory steady state response paradigm at 40 hertz, which is essentially just listening to a, a click train played at 40 hertz over and over and over again. And lastly, resting state fMRI. Um, and just to kind of rattle through the, the, the differences in data features between groups before we get onto the modeling results, um, we essentially, in, in, the, in the data analysis, we didn't really see anything new. We, we were really replicating findings that others have seen, um, which, is, which is reassuring, but not um, novel. And so um, in the resting state EEG, we saw an increase in gamma and theta power in, this, in, the, in the power spectrum, and a decrease in, in beta in the, in the patients here shown in, in red. 
um, in both the eyes open data and in the eyes closed data. So um, uh, eyes clearly have nothing to do with it, those results. Um, in the mismatch negativity, we saw the um, classic finding illustrated by subtracting the, the, the uh, response to these standards uh, from the response, the average responses to these uh, deviants um, at this particular electrode FZ. And that's when you do that, it emphasizes this big negative deflection that you get in response to the deviants at around 200 milliseconds. And classically, this, this deflection is reduced in patients and in the relatives, as you can see here. Um, this is probably the most well replicated finding in all of schizophrenia EG. And then in this auditory steady state response um, task, the, the idea of playing this 40 hertz click train is that it's thought that the circuit between pyramidal cells and interneurons naturally oscillates at around this 40 hertz, uh, i.e. gamma frequency. And so the, the point of playing this click train is to try and induce oscillations in these circuits. And if you can't induce them um, as well as you can in controls, that's an indication that there may be something wrong with this circuit. And indeed, as many other groups have shown, um, in controls, you get this robust um, 40 hertz power, at the onset of this click train, but in the patients and in the relatives, we see a reduction in this, in this uh, power. So then, um, the, because these are different data features, you know, some are evoke responses, some are um, power spectra, they require slightly different um, models, but the underlying microcircuit in all of the models is, is the same, it's common to all paradigms, that's the nice thing about, about um, modelling. And so um, in the resting state EEG, we just use the absolutely simplest possible approach and just um, simulated different power spectra using a single microcircuit model. So we weren't looking at cortical sources, we weren't looking at um, uh, fitting data to individual subjects, we were just simulating data. Um, however, in the mismatch negativity, we were fitting all our models to individual subjects using, uh, with each microcircuit embedded in a particular cortical area. Um, these sources are very well known uh, for the mismatch negativity. Um, and they're based in temporal cortex A1, superior temporal gyrus and the inferior frontal gyrus. For the auditory steady state uh, task at 40 Hertz, we're, again, we're fitting the power spectrum, not the evoked response. So we're DCM for cross spectral densities, but we're just looking at A1 bilaterally, very, very simple. And then lastly, uh, we also looked at resting state fMRI data. You can't use the microcircuit in fMRI um, modeling because there isn't the same temporal definition of the data, but you can make inferences about excitability of different cortical areas. So we looked at, instead of looking at all the whole brain, we chucked away most of the data and just looked, to, looked at the exact same network that you see active in the mismatch negativity uh, during the resting state, uh, during the beeps and boops in the, in the resting state um, fMRI. And to summarize about four years work on uh, one, one slide, we saw some pretty um, striking consistencies across all the different paradigms in, in the model explanations of the group differences. So to begin at this one here, the resting state EEG, those power spectra changes that we saw a few slides ago um, were best explained by a loss of excitability of uh, pyramidal cells, not the interneurons, but the uh, pyramidal cells. Then again, in the mismatch negativity, the, the change in the model that best explained the group differences was again, this loss of excitability of pyramidal cells, particularly in these uh, frontal regions. Then the auditory steady state response task, again, the, this time the difference between um, patients and the relatives, um, which was the most marked group difference, showed again a loss of excitability of pyramidal cells in bilateral um, primary auditory cortex. And then finally in the resting state fMRI analysis, we saw um, a an apparent loss of excitability in inferior frontal gyrus, the exact same um, pattern that we'd seen in this very different uh, mismatch negativity paradigm. Um, 
so this did did seem to to indicate that the, the the kind of fundamental difference between groups is a loss of excitability of of, of pyramidal cells in particular in the disorder. Um, but the interesting thing that we noted was that uh, we also Elliot had also collected some symptom measures. Um, so he was especially interested in auditory symptoms. He'd used lots of auditory paradigms. So he collected an auditory questionnaire about hallucinations and abnormal auditory percepts and illusions and that kind of thing. And what you might expect is that people with the most symptoms would show the strongest uh, effects that you see illustrated here. And that's what we expected. But in fact, the people with the strongest symptoms actually showed a quite different uh, correlation in these models. They actually, the strongest symptoms seem to relate to disinhibition, not, not loss of excitability. And this was the case across the three different models where we actually um, fit them to individual patients. So in, in the auditory steady state, um, abnormal auditory percepts related most to this, this disinhibitory effect, a loss of inhibition of pyramidal cells. In the mismatch negativity, the auditory symptoms related most to a loss of in, uh, self inhibition in this inferior frontal region, which on the left, which is of course um, Broca's area, which is uh, one of its roles is, is, is clearly in the, in the generation of speech, which is interesting given the auditory hallucinations with the symptom that we're looking at. And then lastly, in the resting state fMRI, um, the, the greater auditory uh, misperceptions and hallucinations related to disinhibition within these temporal um, nodes, particularly on the left-hand side. So what this seemed to imply was that perhaps um, symptoms are the price that the brain may pay for restoring um, a balance between a loss of a kind of primary loss of excitability and then um, down regulating its uh, inhibitory function in, or, in order to, to compensate and rebalance E and I and E and I function. So this suggests that maybe in, in schizophrenia you have this, this primary problem loss of gain may be mediated by NMDA receptors on, on pyramidal cells. Um, but then there's a natural kind of down regulation process that in some causes psychosis, perhaps because representations in cortex have become so imprecise um, that abnormal inference ensues. However, you know, this is, this is definitely not knocked down evidence of this. And there could be other explanations. Uh, so for example, maybe we have heterogeneity in, in the population. And you have some people who have this primary problem, a loss of excitability of pyramidal cells, and you have other people who have loss of excitability of interneurons. And if you jumble them all up, they look a bit like um, this. And so re really in future work, what I'd like to try to do is to, it's to discriminate between these two hypotheses. Um, and in addition to that, you know, I have to acknowledge that this, this in self inhibition parameter that we were estimating is pretty um, uh, vaguely connected or, um, to to NMDA receptor function. I mean, you can't make you, there's definitely no one to one mapping from that parameter to NMDA receptor function. A better way to get at NMDA receptor function is to use microcircuit models that actually have parameters for NMDA receptors and GABA receptors in them, um, which which Rosalind has done uh, in fact to great. Um, effects in some of her work. So we're going to start trying to, to, to fit these models instead. And um, the second thing we want to be able to do is to be able to use these inferences at the individual patient level um, to perhaps assign treatments. You know, if you could, you could give an E boosting drug to these people or an I boosting drug to these people. But to do that, you really need to demonstrate reliability at the individual subject level, uh, which has been, uh, you know, not really been been tried very much using these modeling techniques because that the most people use them to look at group differences um, and in a very preliminary work that that has been um, conducted by um, some of my students hope and uh, julia we're beginning to see evidence that um, if you use these conductance based models we do see still an mda receptor mediated effects uh in in patients so in this in this large bsnp data set of p300 and p50 eg paradigms 
um, we're seeing that the, the uh, patients seem to have a loss of this NMDA receptor mediated backward connectivity. And in data from Peter Allhouse's group, um, this auditory steady state task, again, we see um, more evidence of NMDA receptor mediated loss in the patients, especially on uh, superficial pyramidal cells. Uh, but this is all super preliminary, so um, nowhere near publication yet. Um, but yes, that's the plan for um, the future. And um, that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks very much, Richard. Okay, we have time for questions. Um, it would be